guys, Park Naturalist Sammy Evans here at Natural Bridge State Resort Park. Today we're going to do a live tour of our nature center. This way those of you who haven't seen the nature center and haven't been able to get out can enjoy it from the comfort of your home. So let's go ahead and get started. What we're going to do is we're going to walk around all the displays and read the fun display descriptions as well. Alrighty, let's check out our first display. We have a wild turkey and an eastern gray squirrel. Wild turkeys. Once threatened with extinction, the eastern wild turkey's national population has increased from only a few thousand in the early 1900s to millions today due to land conservation efforts and hunting regulations. Males and females exhibit differences in their appearance. With over 5,000 feathers that aid in warmth, protection, and flight, colorful males ordinarily look more attractive than their drab female counterparts. Males typically have beards and display a conspicuous red, white, and blue head as they mature. The Eastern Gray Squirrel As Kentucky State Mammal, the Eastern Gray Squirrel is one of the most common mammals found at Natural Bridge. Gray squirrels should not be confused with the Fox Squirrel, which is somewhat larger and has a pronounced reddish-orange cast in its fur, especially along its flanks and abdomen. A squirrel's diet includes a variety of hard mass fruits such as walnuts, hickory nuts, and oak acorns. Gray squirrels are notorious for caching or hiding their food in the fall months for survival through the harsh winter months. Generally, gray squirrels have two litters each year, one in the late winter in cavity nests and one in midsummer using leaf nests. Here's some fun facts about Natural Bridge. Natural Bridge is 78 feet long. 65 feet high and 20 feet wide. Natural bridge is made of sandstone. Kentucky has over 375 species of birds. And Natural Bridge State Resort Park has 20 miles of hiking trails. Let's move on to our owl display. Owls possess some of the most fascinating and intriguing adaptations of any wildlife in eastern Kentucky. Many folks take note of the ear tufts located atop the head of most owls but those tufts are not ears. The tufts break up the outline of the owl's silhouette and enable it to blend in with the surrounding environment. The unnoticeable ears on the sides of its head are offset to enable pinpoint sound detection of prey rustling in the undergrowth and leaf litter. Due to a fringed leading edge of their soft primary flight feathers, owls are able to quietly glide through the air, offering their prey little, if any, notice to flee. Owls swallow their prey whole, or nearly so, making no effort to avoid bones, hair, and sometimes even feathers. These rather indigestible items are compacted into a ball referred to as a pellet, which is actually regurgitated so that the owl does not have to allow extra time for digestion. So here's the barred owl. Barred owls often find their shelter in natural cavities. Their name is derived from the heavy molting and barring on their chest and flanks. Interestingly, this owl is more commonly referred to as the hoot owl due to its notable call. Although skittish, it is possible to observe barred owls if the surrounding vegetation is thick enough to provide the owl a sense of security. Here's a great horned owl. The great horned owl is the largest resident owl of eastern Kentucky. The owl's wingspan can reach up to 5 feet and can achieve a weight of just over 3 pounds. Great horned owls have a prominent facial disc outlined in black, noticeable large ear tufts, and an interestingly supercalorary eyebrow. A great horned owl can generally feed on prey equivalent in size to that of a large hare. And here's the eastern screech owl. A relatively small owl, the eastern screech owl is commonly found in mixed woodlands all across the eastern U.S. This owl's appearance can be variable. Red and gray morphs can be found, but are the same species. The call is arguably the most interesting characteristic of the eastern screech owl. Its descending whinny and unusual trill can be heard from a long distance and is starkly different from the screech sounds that some may believe this owl produces. Alrighty, let's move on and talk about some niter mining. So how was the mining done? Sandstone rock, which contains niter, was broken into sand. The sand was then placed in a V-shaped leaching vat. Next, hot water would be poured over the sand to dissolve the niter. 
This solution was drained into a wooden collecting trowel and allowed to evaporate. The crystals of niter would be collected and shipped to powder mills in Lexington. Niter was an essential ingredient in the production of gunpowder. So there is a sandstone rock shelter containing two leaching vats and an evaporating trowel. Here is what the evaporating trowels look like. And here's what you get when you add knifer, sulfur, and charcoal. You get gunpowder. Alrighty. Let's move on to our next display, which talks about tree cookies. So this is a white pine cookie. So many folks believe that a large tree is an old tree, but this is not always true. Growth or size of trees is dependent upon the availability of resources, that is sun and soil nutrients. Trees that grow in open areas tend to increase in size at faster rates than trees growing in areas shaded by the canopy. For this reason, large trees are not always the oldest trees. This cross section of a white pine clearly shows the annual growth rings deposited during its residence in the forest canopy of eastern Kentucky. This cross section allows for us to see that this tree lived for approximately 100 years before falling to the forest floor. If you look more closely, some of the rings seem extraordinarily wide, while some appear to be unusually narrow. Larger rings indicate favorable growth, less harsh summers, and ample precipitation whereas narrow rings provide evidence of droughts and harsh growing conditions. So there you can kind of see some of the rings. The Cumberland Plateau region of eastern Kentucky is dominated by mixed mesophytic forest, a forest type that is regarded as one of the most biological diverse forests on the planet. Within this region of the U.S., we encounter alternating seasons of hot and cold weather, and because of this, our diverse array of tree species experience a dormant period through the winter, when growth is limited or non-existent. During warmer months, new growth is deposited in the form of concentric growth rings in tree cross-sections known as cookies. Each growing season, this new growth is shown as a ring comprised of a lighter area, early season growth, in a darker area, late season growth. The appearance of these rings can vary in thickness based on growing conditions. Thicker rings indicate a growing season with adequate precipitation and lacking excessive heat. Alrighty, let's check out our black bear display. Alrighty, the black bear. As Kentucky's only representative bear, the black bear is one of the most intriguing mammals in the state. Although many believe that black bears are carnivorous, these bears are truly omnivores, quite often supplementing their diet by consuming berries and other plant material. In general, Kentucky's black bears may become lethargic in the winters, but may not hibernate because our winters aren't severe enough to hinder them from foraging. Farther north, where the winters are more severe, black bears will enter into hibernation to increase their chance of survival. Although it is possible to see a black bear during your visit to Natural Bridge, it is not likely. However, it is crucial that you do not attempt to feed a black bear if you encounter one while hiking the trails or in the campgrounds. Feeding wild animals has been proven to cause these animals to lose their fear of humans and ultimately become aggressive and harmful to other visitors. For wildlife safety, and especially yours, please do not feed wildlife. So there's our little black bear. And typically if we do see a bear here, it's what we call a rogue male bear. So basically, it wasn't the alpha male and it got kicked out. And it's just kind of wandering through, working its way, uh, usually towards Tennessee, to find some love. Alrighty. Let's check out this white-tailed deer exhibit. The white-tailed deer, named for its behavior of raising its large white tail when fleeing from danger, is one of the largest mammals in Kentucky. Typically, only male white-tailed deer, called bucks, have antlers. During the spring and summer, the antlers grow and are covered in a thin layer of velvet. During autumn, the antlers harden into bone and the velvet is rubbed off. The antlers become polished and pointed at the onset of baiting season, known as the rut when males use their antlers for dominance and for display to females. 
Eventually in late winter, a buck's antlers will fall off and be replaced in the spring with a new antler covered in velvet. White-tailed deer have four chambered stomach, which enables them to eat a variety of foods, including twigs and buds of trees, berries, acorns, nuts, crops such as corn and soybean, and occasionally the leaves of a herbaceous plant. White-tailed deer prefer open farmland, open woodland, and woodland edges rather than the heavily forested and steep terrain, which is common in the area around Natural Bridge. While white-tailed deer are occasionally seen here, the numbers are much lower than those in north, central, and western Kentucky. Here we have some trees that are essential to life. So we have the sycamore. So soil is very important for trees. After tree leaves fall to the ground, they decompose and become soil, which is necessary for the life of plants and animals. We have some white pine. Trees provide wood, which is important for building material, paper, and making fire. This tree's wood was prized for ship masts during the colonial period. We have the tulip tree. It is reported that pioneers hollowed out single logs from this tree to make a canoe, which is why it's sometimes called the canoe wood tree. We have an eastern hemlock, which was used for medicinal purposes. It treated colds, fever, and scurvy. We have the big leaf magnolia, which as all trees help provide oxygen. Trees provide oxygen by absorbing carbon dioxide from the air. We've got some red maple, which is notable for its color. In autumn, this tree is a favorite due to the brilliant red color it displays. And we've got the white oak. So humans and animals alike have eaten the sweet acorns that are produced by this tree. And we have the American beech which is notable for shelter. This tree offers many useful nesting cavities for animals such as owls, squirrels, and raccoons. Let's move along here to our display of the rough get grouse and the bobcat. So the bobcat. The bobcat, named for its short and stubby bobbed tail, is a small wild cat that is common at the park but rarely seen by visitors due to its shy and secretive behavior. Bobcats hunt by stealthily stalking or patiently ambushing prey, which includes rabbits, rodents, birds, possums, raccoons, and other animals. So this bobcat is, looks like he's stalking this ruffed grouse. So the ruffed grouse. They are non-migratory birds whose range is closely associated to that of the Appalachian Mountains. Although their appearance is fairly similar, the males have a distinct behavior and call. During courtship, males will drum to attract females by beating their wings rapidly on their sides. Males also display ruffs along the sides of their neck and a rays across the top of their heads. Renowned naturalist and ornithologist John James Audubon once described this sound as a tremor in the air not unlike distant thunder. As a species that inhabits mature mixed woodlands, habitat fragmentation could potentially pose an increased risk to rough grass populations. All right, let's check out some of the foxes. We have a red fox and a common gray fox. So the red fox, unlike the gray fox, the red fox is not able to climb trees. Regarded as an opportunist, the red fox commonly feeds on whatever it is at its disposal. Birds, small mammals during cold months, and primarily vegetation and insects during the warmer months of the year. Red foxes are sensitive to low frequency sound, which is uncommon to most other mammals. When stalking its prey, a red fox may listen for the subtle sound of digging or gnawing under the leaf litter and, upon detection of such noise, begin to frantically dig into the soil to capture its prey. The Common Gray Fox Gray foxes are ordinarily seen during the few hours surrounding dawn and dusk. During the day, these elusive mammals may reside in thick vegetation and blend in well with their environment. As the only member of the dog family with true climbing ability, they often resort to trees for refuge and to feed. 
Alrighty, here we have some hawks. This is a Cooper's hawk. This is also known as a bird hawk. It has short, rounded wings and long tails, which enable them to maneuver with ease through the branches of trees in the forest. This hawk hunts medium-sized birds and small mammals from perches under the forest canopy. In spring, a nesting pair of Cooper's hawks will build a bulky nest formed with small branches and tree bark. Cooper's hawks are often confused with the similar sharp-shinned hawks. Alrighty, here we have a juvenile red-tailed hawk. One of the most broadly distributed hawks in North America, the red-tailed hawk prefers open fields interspersed with woods, bluffs, and streams. Binocular-like vision allows the hawk to detect small prey at great distances. It feeds primarily on small mammals, snakes, and birds. This hawk is most commonly seen in this area either soaring overhead or perched on roadside trees and power lines. The wingspan of this large hawk can reach five feet. Young red-tailed hawks lack red tail feathers and instead have tail feathers with alternating light and brown bars. Alrighty. So this is a little display of the old railroad system that used to be here. In 1882, the Kentucky Union Railway Company began its eastward construction of a rail line extending from Lexington towards Virginia on a quest for lumber and coal from the Appalachian Mountains. By 1889, the line traveled through what is now Natural Bridge State Park and reached Jackson in 1891. Due to bankruptcy, the Kentucky Union Railway Company sold to the Lexington and Eastern Railway in 1894, which began operating two round-trip passenger trains each day from Lexington to Jackson. Natural Bridge Park, under ownership of L&E, opened in 1895, but was only accessible to the public by the L&E excursion train. And just so you guys know, a fun little fact, it only cost 10 cents for people to take this excursion train to Natural Bridge. And here is kind of another depiction of the timber fortune. The Kentucky Union Lumber Company brought thousands of acres of land along the upper Red River, including all of what is now Natural Bridge State Park. The railroad reached Slade in 1889 and the town quickly became a hot spot for timber speculators. By 1900, the amount of timber being harvested was staggering. Just after the turn of the century, the largest sawmill in the eastern U.S. was in operation at Clay City, Kentucky. By the end of World War I, however, the timber and fortune were gone. So there's a very old picture right there of some of the workers on the lumber mill. And this gentleman here is by a mature tree. So the mature Appalachian forest in the late 1800s and early 1900s consisted of many trees with trunks that would measure over five feet in diameter. Alrighty, so also here we have just some fun little posters of some of the local things you can find here. So here are some spring flowers of the Red River Gorge and a natural bridge. We have a yellow lady slipper, jack in the pulpit, wild geranium, red terrillium, flowering dogwood, tulip tree, uh, hepatica. So we have quite a variety of wildflowers and most of these will be blooming in the end of April. Uh, we also have a variety of reptiles and amphibians here at Natural Bridge. Uh, we have timber rattle snakes, copperheads, garter snakes, eastern milk snakes, black king snakes, broadhead skinks, cave salamanders, snapping turtles, cumberland sliders, cope's gray tree frog, and many more. And we also are known for our caterpillars, so we do an awesome caterpillar hunt. So this is a variety of caterpillars here that we have. Common is the milkweed tussock, the black wave flannel, the banded tussock, the red humped, the saddleback, which does sting, the sycamore tussock, the eastern tiger swallowtail, 
and the American Dagger Moth. But you can find all of these on our caterpillar hunt. So thank you guys for coming on this live tour with me. I hope everyone had fun. Um, let's actually hit this last one that talks about how our bridge was formed. So first there was erosion. So a thin piece of sandstone is isolated on the ridge top. Then the erosion continued and took away the softer sandstone layers, which is known as capstone layers. Once the erosion process reaches the other side, a small hole or window is opened upon the rim. And finally, that window begins to widen and eventually makes an arch under the capstone, which is how we have what we know today as natural bridge. So thank you guys for checking out the Nature Center with me. I hope everyone had a good time. I hope everyone is staying safe. And when this outbreak ceases, come on down to Natural Bridge State Resort Park and check out the Nature Center for yourself. Thanks, guys. Bye.